Hello, everyone, and welcome to Gendering Geopolitics, my new Twitter series that consists of 10 minute conversations with women who are shaking things up in the world. My name is Emily Prey, and I'm a senior analyst at the New Lines Institute in Washington, DC. And today I'm so excited to introduce my guest, the award-winning journalist, Jane Ferguson, who is coming to us from Dubai. Thank you so much for being here, Jane. Thanks for having me, Emily, looking forward to it. So today we're gonna just dive right into the end of America's longest war. So what does the withdrawal of troops from Afghanistan mean for women, girls, and minorities there, especially when some experts are saying that the Taliban is stronger now than it has been in the last two decades? It means a vast amount of insecurity, uncertainty, first and foremost, as it does for all Afghans of any gender, but for women in particular. This is a group where they are speaking with such vast confidence. They, they feel very much so empowered. They feel like they won this war. So they feel like they will be coming into, at the very least, share power, if not you know, could try to continue to, to, to take even more power and run the country. And this is a group that is famous for its poor treatment of women, and that's being pretty generous um, when the Taliban ran Afghanistan. Women don't know what form of government they're going to end up having. They have been vastly underrepresented at attempts to get peace talks with the Taliban. And the Taliban themselves have been prevaricating and really dodging questions about what kind of rights they would afford women in a government that could be dominated by them. So either way you look at it, it's not looking good for, for, for many women in Afghanistan. Um, and the uh, the uncertainty is only adding to, to the anxiety. So the, the freedom of women was often cited by the U.S. as a reason for staying in Afghanistan and for fighting the Taliban. Withdrawing will, as you said, likely have the opposite effect. We know um, how the Taliban views women and the, the government is not exactly a bastion of women's rights either. How does this broken promise, number one, reflect on the U.S., um, and number two, what are the implications and consequences that the U.S. doesn't keep its promises, particularly with regards um, to protecting women's and minority rights in the country and in the region at large? Well, when it comes to promises kept, when it comes to American foreign policy, we could we could roll that out into a number of issues. I mean, I, I in Afghanistan several times over the last couple of years, I've ended up having conversations with people about the Kurds in Syria um, and, and and these sorts of discussions. But when it comes to to the premise of going into Afghanistan and what were some of the early aims of this war way back after 9-11, yes, women women's rights were 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 very much so high on the agenda, as was nation building, education, infrastructure. These all very slowly were things that politicians and military figures talked about, but very slowly stopped talking about them. As the war went badly, these priorities very much so fell by the wayside. And what we're seeing now is, is really no discussion at all. Um, we're trying to see, uh, what we're seeing is, is an America that's trying to, to extract itself from this war. Um, and it's very unlikely they'll even end this war. So in, in terms of American policy. I think a long time ago, people stopped talking about women's rights in Afghanistan. And so this is not a new thing that came along with these peace talks that that, uh, that started under Trump or this peace deal. No one you know, in Washington, D.C. has been talking very seriously within administrations, certainly within the Trump administration, about women's rights uh, for years. So this doesn't come as a vast surprise. But I would say, again, the, the, the most shocking and the most frustrating thing for a lot of Afghan women is not being at the table, at least for the negotiations. For a shock, the, these negotiations, you know, the, the, they, they face vast, vast challenges in trying to actually get anything off the ground or, or come to any kind of agreement to prevent civil war, but they are the best shot at it, and women are not being represented even at those. And that's, uh, that's something that a lot of Afghan women I've spoken to feel like America could push harder for. You know, they understand that this war has not gone as anybody had planned, uh, certainly from, from the American perspective, but for women, they, there, there's a sense that America could still help them by making sure that they have more, literally more seats at the table. 
Yeah, so so we know that when women are part of the peace processes, that peace is longer lasting and it's more successful. Um, and as you said, unfortunately, but unsurprisingly, women's voices have been sorely lacking from these negotiations over the last years. Will there be a time when Afghan women not only have a seat at the table, um, but also have a say in their future? I certainly hope so. I mean, this table isn't just about ceasefires. This table is about the state going forward. Afghan women do have rights enshrined in law, but it's, you know, even, even those are now under threat. It, there's a sense that everything is, you know, up for grabs. Everything's up for discussion. So Afghan women, if they can get into those rooms to sit down with the Taliban and discuss what exactly they mean by women's rights, within Islamic principles, which is what they tend to say. They've said that to everybody that they speak to, but they're extraordinarily vague about that. Um, you know, women need to be in the room to, to, to get them to be more specific and to make sure that these, that these rights are enshrined in whatever agreements do come along, if there are any agreements. So I can't tell you if that's gonna happen, but I can tell you that a lot of women are pushing very hard to get into the, into the rooms right now, where things like constitutional issues are being discussed discussed, uh, women's rights, women's education, uh, women's protections, these sorts of things, you know, are, are, are all going to be hopefully discussed at some stage if the talks can continue. But if those talks collapse and we don't see any progress, and in fact, we, if we do see Afghanistan edge more towards a civil war, that's where, where women's voices are, are even more drowned out. And it's worth pointing out, you know, as when we discuss women's rights in Afghanistan, it is worth pointing out that, you know, many women enjoy education and professions and they want to go on and they have what you or I would see as as women's rights uh, in, in terms of modernity and, 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 and their modern lives and their own independence. But there's also in Afghanistan a huge amount of women who really, for them, the rights that they really want um, are rights to health care. You know, rights to, to be able to, uh, you know, feed their children, to be able to live in peace. So, you know, not all women in Afghanistan want to go to college and have careers in the city, but they all have something that they want. And, 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 and I would say the most universal thing is an end to the violence and a protection of their own personal physical rights above all else. I think that's a really important point that you raised that, you know, not all women need to have a master's degree. They don't all need to be doctors and lawyers and politicians, but it is important to be able to have access to those rights, to have those options so that they can, they can um, choose what kind of future they want. Um, so moving forward, what new strategies can the U.S. employ to replace its failed military strategy, you know, like diplomacy or conditional aid, to put pressure on whoever is in power to protect the rights of all Afghans? It's a big challenge. You know, it's very hard to measure at this stage exactly how much leverage the, the United States really has over the over the various parties. Um, you know, and this would end up having to be a much more international effort. It would have to be in collaboration with the United Nations and with and with other other nations that are involved in in whatever kind of peacemaking process. However, that ends up that ends up. Uh, forming over the next year, you know, everybody involved would have to be applying pressure. I think the United States alone, it would not be enough. But as you say, conditional aid is smart, as well as, you know, you can always introduce things like quotas when it comes to negotiations. You can, you can try to, try to, uh, push women not only into the room, but to make sure that they're actually listened to. Over the years, we've seen women, and, and this has been a particular problem with the Afghan government in Kabul sometimes, is that you know women can get into the room or, or appointed to certain positions, but are they listened to? Are they making policy? Are they the ones who are actually pushing the conversations forward and having very real influence and power. And I think that would be the most important thing to make sure that, you know, if the United States is going to implement things like conditional aid or quotas for women in negotiations, then or or, or within government ministries, however, however the 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 government or the a future administration of, of Afghanistan looks, it's about making sure that it's real and that it's not just for photo ops. And I think that would be the most important and vital change for women in Kabul who are ready to lead. Yes, absolutely. Avoiding tokenization, I think, will be 
critical for the future of women's rights in Afghanistan. So that is um, that was all the time we have today, but thank you so much for joining me, Jane. This has been very enlightening, and I look forward to hearing your thoughts in the future on this issue. Thanks for having me.